Thank you. Uh, he asked my first question. Um, I was going to ask how many people here um, uh, read HBR, and it's great to see that many hands, so thank you very much for that. And it was really interesting and it's personally rewarding for me um, to see so many of you uh, engaging with it digitally. Um, that, that wasn't the case uh, nine years ago. I was hired on uh, at HBR to be their first online hire um, in late 2006. Um, and kind of what I'd like to do today is um, walk you through that journey in kind of an expedited way. Um, and, and kind of bring you up to where we are today and how we have tried to use you know some of the some of the, 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 the principles that we that we know from, from lean but also some of uh, the theoretical forebears uh, that really kind of helped it to, um, to crystallize into that to that concept so a lot of familiarity here with HBR which is terrific um, a lot of people have some misconceptions about HBR when I talk sometimes at events like this or just one-on-one -on -one with folks there's an impression that like we're subsidized by the school or that we only uh, print stuff from Harvard neither of those are true so we are a separate company it's wholly owned by the school um, we're set up as a nonprofit any, any gains that we do may go back to the school every year um, so we're in the marketplace competing with everyone else uh, we're selling advertisements we're selling subscriptions we actually have a huge e-commerce operation as part of the website um, so you know we're we're faced with the same throws and challenges that the larger media world has been faced with for the last 10, 15, or even longer years. Um, uh, so it's really it, it makes for a unique environment to be a nonprofit, which really kind of puts some interesting restrictions on the way that we can capitalize uh, some of our digital efforts um, and the need to kind of keep things lean, uh, just just in that kind of within that those those constrictions. Um, but that have really, I think, really been pretty uh, instrumental to, to the success that we've seen. So I want to kind of walk you through um, some of that. Um, and again, it's just so great to see so many hands of people who are familiar with, with HBR. Um, so probably not any of you, though, were familiar with HBR when this is what the publication looked like. It's a 94-year-old brand. Um, it's been published you know, for, for longer than almost any other um, existing uh, media brand, with the exception of like The Economist and National Geographic and a very, very limited number of others. And for a while, for about you know, 85 of those years, 86 of those years, this is essentially what it was. It was a print publication. And it was set up 90 plus years ago in a really, really smart way. It was not meant to be a house organ for, for Harvard Business School. It was to find the best ideas in leadership and management from around the world. And we actually do keep tracks of how much content we are publishing from Harvard. It's about 25%. So only about 25% of the total count content output really comes from Harvard. So it really, really cast a wide, a wide lens. And this is interesting. This is, we have a huge, well not huge, we have a big library with all of the, the issues going back all those years. And you obviously can't see this, but this is from 1955. Um, and uh, the subtitle is The Magazine for Thoughtful Businessmen. Uh, which was the way that they talked about things like that back then. And if you kind of push away some of the come up some of the art, you know, the artifice, like you know, everyone's in a, a masculine pronoun and, and that kind of stuff from, from that time, you could actually see some articles here that are actually pretty interesting. One of them here, as you, you can't see, um, is the engineer goes into management. You know, that's, an, that's an issue that we all are faced with, right? As people kind of rise up in the technology realm and then suddenly they have to become leaders. And it's a whole different ballgame. And, and, th and that was something that they were talking about 60 years ago. They have an article there called The Economics of the Digital Computer. I don't know what that meant 60 years ago, and I can't imagine that those economics were very good. Um, but they were talking about it then. And a lot of our content went up that we produce is pretty timeless. And that's really a kind of a, a, a point that, that I'll, I'll touch back upon because it's really a key part of how we think about our value to our users and, and kind of the value that the users um, uh, get from us as well. So that's what it was for about 86 of those years. And then we really started to advance it to where we are um, today. And it's a fundamentally different proposition. It's a fundamentally different relationship. I mean, just seeing the number of hands, I would say 85% of the people here who raised their hand did so digitally. And that's remarkable. We've really been able to kind of make that. It was a wonderful introduction, a little bit um, uh, embarrassing, although I did supply that anecdote to him. Um, uh, but it, we have, we've really put it together a really amazing team that has really helped to, to build this up. Um, and un unlike a lot of the news that we all see as it faces to the, to the media world, we've been able to run, run counter to some of those trends, um, where we've got you know, circulation is an all-time high. Um, we've been able to improve the willingness to pay. You know, coming out of the economic recession seven years or so ago, we had to drop our subscription price down to about $79 an issue. We brought that back up to $99 an issue, and that's all through kind of a lot of the digital activities that we've been able to do. Um, we've really been focusing a lot on understanding who our users are, doing a lot of testing, um, and, and then building new products for sale or for, for part of membership um, that are really based on that. 
And a lot of that is coming through from, from the website. Um, but things always weren't as rosy as they, as they, as they are, and again, still facing challenges. Um, we've had to come a long way. When I, was, when I walked in the door, um, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and kind of came up with my plan, this is where I think we want to go, and, and put it in front of, of my then boss, he said to me, he said, HBR, and part of it was to grow a blog network. That was like the first thing. It was, you know, 2006, 2007. That was what people were doing. We needed to get something going. Um, he said, HBR is a magazine that will be blogged about, but that shall never blog. And I, I literally wrote that down in a notebook, and I think I still have that notebook because it was just such a, a beautiful crystallization of, of, of some of the challenges that we were up against. And when I started to look under the hood and try and understand what I actually could do with the site that I had inherited, um, I actually, the only thing that I could control, again, as the editor of the site, was 1,200 characters on the homepage. I mean, I was tweeting before Twitter was even, you know, uh, uh, conceived there. I mean, there were some huge challenges there. So, remarkably, we were able to, to um, actually pull a page from, I think, one of Eric Reese's forebears, uh, Clay Christensen, and, and really kind of create kind of a new co inside of Corco. So, the HBR was really focused on the print. We created a separate digital team and really started to try and do some innovation here. And these are some of the key things that we learned from some of those early years, and I'll fast forward through them. One is, be something, and I'll explain what that means later. Second is be patient. You know, we live in such a fast-paced, technology-fueled society and fail fast and first mover advantage, and some of those are certainly valid, but a lot of times what you think about, especially if you're building something within an established company versus a startup, is some of these changes are really against culture, against people, et cetera, and that can take a really long time. Actually, let me pause for a quick second. How many people here are working for startups? Okay, how many people are working for larger companies trying to drive innovation? Okay, so a little bit more of the inside companies, which is good, because that's, I think, the relevance here, and I think Winnie, uh, maybe we'll speak a little bit more about that here in a few minutes. So be patient, and a third is something that I think we've really finally been able to do more recently. We just relaunched the site about a year ago, almost exactly a year, um, uh, and that was really built with the user in mind on walkthrough, kind of how that, how that means. So the first thing was, was being something. As I mentioned when I came up with that initial digital plan, I just wanted to get a blog network out there and, and just get started with audio and maybe some early videos. We just had to get started. I remember going before the board, one of the first board meetings that I had, and we proposed the blog network. And you know, there, was some, there was some trepidation at that level as well. And they, they kind of said, well, do you think you could start with maybe just, just one blogger? You know, we said, well, technically one blogger is not a network. Um, so we'd have to you know, call it something differently there. Um, but, but we really just wanted to get started. And, and we needed to figure out a, a framework that worked for us. And um, you know, luckily, we work for the Harvard Business Review, so there are a lot of um, ideas and strategies that we can reference. And so we chose one um, that I think, too, also has some, some antecedents with the Lean Startup Theory, which was, which was something called Building Breakthrough Businesses Inside of Established Organizations. And it's a theory, and it's an article, and eventually a book. Um, it was written by Chris Trimble uh, and Vijay uh, Gavindarajan, uh, who were both out of Dartmouth. Um, and it talks about the things that you need to do if you really are trying to drive innovation inside of an established company. The first thing is you need to figure out what you need to forget from that core business. You know? So for us, some of the things that we realized that we needed to forget from HBR Mothership, the magazine, were a lot of its editorial processes. Right? I mean, one, of the, one of the fundamental value propositions that HBR prints, and, and to a different degree, the web, uh, has is the, the meticulous editorial detail that it puts through. And it takes sometimes 18 months to get a, an article through the magazine process editorially. But the result is an absolutely airtight. We couldn't afford to do that. We couldn't hire that many editors. We had to publish something every day. So we needed to forget you know, the editorial processes that were, that were uh, in place there. Second thing you need to figure out is what are you going to borrow? You know, what is it that ha the core company has that can give you a huge advantage in your new marketplace? So for us, it was things like some of the relationships with the authors, uh, some of the, the brand, obviously, was a, a, huge, a huge thing that we wanted to try and leverage. And the third thing, this might be one of the most important, is what do you need to learn? I talked about kind of the value proposition around editorial quality that the magazine, we need to figure out what quality meant for us. We needed to figure out, we needed to learn what our audience was going to respond to. You know, I remember when we were first getting started with video, um, I bought flip, yeah, window, whatever that, like the Cisco bought that, that digital camera thing, video camera, and we were, an author would come in and I would literally like, you know, put him up against the wall and we would say, okay, let's talk. And I remember at one point, like, you know, we, we started hearing comments and then the CEO came down and it was in a terrible time in our history when like a lot of those hostage videos were being a big shot. They were like, that looks like a hostage video. Get that off of there. So we, we had to learn kind of what was appropriate for some of these young, some of these newer um, efforts that we were doing. Um, the second thing that we needed to do, as I referenced, was 
be patient. Um, you know, we really thought we were going hit, to hit the, hit, the, um, hit the ground running, and we were, were able to show progress right away, but this took time. You know, we, we were only prints when we were first getting started. We had about 250, it was a little bit less uh, there. Uh, uh, two, I'm sorry, 200,000 web visitors a month. The whole site was locked up. You could only get content that was behind the wall. Uh, and we had about 200,000 subscribers. Um, and obviously things like Facebook and whatnot really weren't. Um, I think you had to have a .edu uh, email address to have a Facebook profile then. Um, HBR really had no um, uh, online programming. And we really had no, the, the brand really had no uh, concept of where it wanted to go in the digital future. And so we had to kind of build momentum. We had to take some of those first steps. And again, you flash forward to today, where we have the, the biggest branded group on LinkedIn. We have about two and a half million Twitter followers. Uh, about six million now um, uh, online visitors a month, and it's taken us about eight years. So I want to pause uh, there and talk about the third lesson because it really brings us to more closely to, the, to, the, to the, the present, which is around being obsessed with the user. So about two and a half years ago, we, um, we decided that we needed to really, we had done some strategy evolution about really, really crystallized how we were going to be focused on adding more value digitally for subscribers and kind of weaning away from, from the focus on print. And really flipping the mindset, we never would use this in any kind of marketing, but flipping the mindset from being a subscriber to being a member. You know, so that you really were a member of this, this, this club or this, or this, this community, um, and we would provide exclusive assets and exclusive um, access to you through the digital realm primarily. So we did a lot of research on this and, and did a lot of uh, consultation with users and, and whatnot, and a lot of modeling to figure out this is the right approach, and we did. But we realized that the site that we had in place was not going to get us there. It was built on some very, very old systems. It was built, frankly, at a time of a reorg that we did around 2010. So a lot of it was to appease internal users. Um, you know, just needed a, a really a pretty considerable rethink. And I know that runs anathema to some of the concepts of lead, right? In a lot of ways, we realized that we kind of had to do almost a waterfall approach. We had to kind of go through a big bang launch. One of the reasons for that is because the company had made the decision to start to move to move everything to uh, Amazon, and we were going to be the first big move, and that was going to correspond with the redesign. And we just couldn't, for the amount of resources that we had development-wise, partition off some of it to Amazon while still hosting some of it locally, and so we had to go all or nothing into to, um, to Amazon. We also had to, we had to update our purchasing. We were like three revisions behind on our search platform, so we had huge um, plumbing things we had to do. We were importing a new CMS. We were expanding it into the, the magazine production schedule, so another huge thing. Um, we wanted to make the site more personally relevant. We wanted to refocus it on a premium experience where the, the previous site had really atrophied from a design and user uh, experience standpoint, and we wanted to really uh, make it more personally relevant there. So the personalization platform, and we frankly, we didn't have the internal uh, design and technology capacity to work inside and work in-house and work in that more iterative way. So we had to go outsource for a lot of the development. We had to go outsource for a lot of the design shops. And at least the folks that we were talking to, it was really difficult to, um, to do things in a truly agile way. Um, and frankly, we didn't even have that agile knowledge base um, and those, that, those frameworks in place. So we started with the last one first. We got about three days of training. We hired a consultant to help us and work alongside us to help us understand that. So even though there was a release, was over a year out from the day that it started. We were working in a very iterative, agile way with talking to users every single week. And one of the first things we decided was we wanted to build the site in a really user-centric way. And I gotta tell you that we didn't really know what that meant. You know, we knew it was the right thing to do and we knew that that was the way that we were gonna unlock value and provide value. So we needed to spend a couple of months internally just figuring out what would that mean at a high level when we came up with these tenants here and then what, is that, what are the decisions then that spill out of this? And so we spent some time thinking about this, and we came up with these seven. Um, and then we actually started to kind of go a level or two deeper for each. Okay, well, if we're going to not waste our users' time, what does that mean? Okay, well, currently in the old site, to register, you had to go through three screens. That's a waste of time. We've got to do it in one. Well, you can't get rid of that second. Well, we're going to have to get rid of that second screen. So each one of these tenets really had spillover into some pretty, in some cases, large um, uh, changes that had happened throughout the organization. But we kept these on the wall and we kept referencing back to them um, with, every, with, every, um, with every turn. We talked to users every single week. It was a year and a half long project. And we started in early you know, concepts. How do you find value? What are your, some of the things that you're interested in? To pushing pieces of paper across the table to them, to doing a remote kind of 
flat wireframe reviews, all the way through to where we were just focused towards the end on just really small scale interaction um, flows. And it really provided value. Uh, we were able to make the case because of the value we saw there to hire on a UX um, person, which was a huge victory for us. Um, and things really started to go pretty well. We launched about a year ago, um, and it's been a, a, a great year since then. But very early on uh, in, the, in the project, as I was starting to get some of the first designs back from the, the firm that we work with, Huge, who did a, a great job for us, um, I kind of had a moment of panic. I realized that no one was really set up to manage the site. I mean, I was managing the whole, whole kind of project and, and, and trying to help build the organization around it, but who was going to manage the article page after it went live? Like, who was going to be managing the onboarding process? We just didn't have the resources. We didn't have the corporate structures in place to do that. And I was out early in the project talking with a friend of mine, having a beer, kind of complaining uh, about things, or just expressing my concerns. And, and again, my background's in editorial. And you know, he said, I think you're becoming a product manager. I was like, no, that's, that's, that can't be true. You know, there's, I'm an editor, what are you talking about? I'm a product manager. So I started looking into and researching something, which is probably like, duh for all of you here, but um, I realized, in fact, that's what I was doing, and I, in fact, had been doing it for some time. And I really began to realize that that was something that our whole company needed to do and our, and our, our industry needed to do. And I know a lot of you here are probably affiliated with technology companies, in the traditional media world, unlike some of the digital uh, first media organizations, there's really not an understanding of or an, or an embrace of the role of product management. You know, it's still very much an editorially led culture because in a lot of ways they see the editorial uh, article or artifact as the product. And there's a lot of validity to that, but it misses a whole part of the consideration. Um, and I thought that this quote from um, Esmond Sunday um, really accurately uh, captures where the traditional media uh, world is and where it frankly needs to be to, to survive. Because I mentioned, editorial, again, where I come from, so I've got no, no problem with this, has been really the center of the culture and the center of innovation for this. But they're not tasked with, nor, nor, nor should we be, tasked with um, really diving into the user's needs, really thinking about the technical implications and whatnot. We need everyone, I think, within editorial to start to think more of that and to adapt more of a product management mindset, but that's different from the product management discipline. So I was able to, thankfully, successfully uh, argue for the creation of product management function, which is my current role. Uh, so I'm overseeing uh, product management and digital strategy and really trying to grow that. Um, focused on you know, three things. This is a pretty classic um, kind of representation of it. First and foremost, thinking about the user need. You know, what is that user's need? What are our business goals? We obviously can't go build something unless there's a, it does align with, with something uh, that we're trying to do as a business. And third, is it feasible? A lot of times when you see this uh, Venn diagram describing product management, that feasible is around tech. Um, and that's certainly one of the considerations that we need to make from a feasibility standpoint. You know, can we build this? But also, is it something that our editorial team can support? Is it something that they believe in? Is it something, obviously, that our marketing team can sell? So that notion of feasibility is really a, a critical one. And I think that the, 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 the focus on the user need is, is where I think this is, is so critical and such a key part of the product management function for us. Because I think we can all agree that user, the, the, the expectation for the level of quality that a user has today in the digital realm is at nosebleed levels. I've been working online for about 20 years. And you used to get a, be able to get away with legitimately a subpar site because users' expectations were already down here. You know, about 10 years ago with the advent of the phone, iPhone, or recently with uh, the iPad, and with the, more recently with the flood of billions of dollars of venture capital coming into consumer web and app companies, hopefully many of you are beneficiaries of that, focused on driving, driving frictionless, delightful user experiences. That's where people are today. Facebook spends almost $2 billion a quarter on R&D. So if you're not thinking about the user's need at the center of what you're trying to do, and either adapting a lean, lean, lean approach or something, then, then, then you're missing the mark in a lot of ways from expectations. Now obviously hardly any of us here can compete with Facebook along, along those lines, but calling your shots, figuring out what is critically important to you and, and letting go of the things that aren't um, is a key part of that. But, that's something that we're really focused on. This is a very busy slide. I think we're sending these slides around and they'll be available. So this is just kind of a way to look at it. For, so for our product management function, we've got that foundational thing, looking at users' needs through research, through interviews and whatnot, iterating on that, again, embracing some of the iterative approaches um, from Lean. And then we actually, as I mentioned, we sell products. So we take that data and we build products that we think have a pretty good uh, likelihood of success. 
And then I've got a couple of product managers now thinking about components of the site, key user flows. And so that's how we've been able to structure it. I talk a lot to uh, media companies, talking with Dan Costa, the executive editor of PC Mag, right here, um, talking about how do firms view the product management function. And there's no definition. There probably isn't in some of your firms. It seems universal. Um, but this is the variant that, that, that really is so far working for us. Um, so the proof is in the pudding, right? So this is, this is just a, a chart, lots of pretty colors. Basically, I was told I have a laser. Awesome, lasers are awesome. Two years ago, 53% of the people who subscribed to the magazine got print only. They had no digital access. Fast forward to this year, our last fiscal year actually for us, that's, there is actually a little bit of red there. And now you've got about almost 60 people who are buying print and online. Part of that, to be sure, is a de-emphasizing market. Um, so we're, we're, not, we're not promoting that as heavily as we once were. But a lot of it is, I think, as a result of the, the efforts that we've done, a lot of the um, decisions we've made to prioritize providing value to users versus just capturing, that has really made that more appealing. Uh, and you can't see from the, the top line there, but we're actually now at an all-time high um, of, of, for circulation at $100 a year uh, because of, I think, some of the decisions and some of the values that we're providing um, in the digital realm. So I set my watch timer for 20 minutes, and it's now starting to, uh, to shake on me there. So um, uh, that's it. So I'll be back in a few minutes to answer any questions you have. Thank you.